chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And this is the chapter that we find the prophecy concerning the 70 years. Uh, Daniel will read this uh, years later. And he'll, and he'll think about the time, and he'll say, well, that 70 years is almost up. And he'll, he'll fast and pray, confess his sins and the sins of his nation, the people of Israel. And it won't be long, and they'll start returning back to their homeland. And God kept his word even in this, and he's always faithful to keep every promise that he's ever given. But Jeremiah 25, verse 1 the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is, three and, and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking. But ye have not hearkened. And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early, and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, those prophets said, Turn ye again now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, that is, making of idols. And I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone and the light of the candle, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans will make it a, a perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it. Even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations, for many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening and the privilege of coming before you uh, to worship you. And Lord, the truth is the world should be bowed uh, before you on their knee, giving you the uh, proper adoration and praise that you are worthy of. But Lord, we're here gathered together in your name, and we desire, God, to lift up the wonderful name of Jesus, and we pray, God, somehow that you would work in every heart, exercise every heart. Lord, stir the individuals of this worship service and help us, God, to hear your 
word. And Lord, help us to see how that you're faithful to do exactly what you said that you would do. And God, help us to remember that you've given us some certain promises and steadfast and, Lord, uh, sure promises. And then help us, God, to believe and, Lord, to live in such a way, to behave ourselves in such a way that we give evidence, God, that we do certainly believe the Word of God. Lord, please help us, God, that we might uh, grow in our affection uh, to you and, and our commitment to you. Help each one of us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you can imagine, Jeremiah's ministry must have been exasperating. Uh, a very difficult ministry, no doubt. I wonder, I wonder how Jeremiah was able to keep a tender heart, uh, not only in the book of Jeremiah, but also in the book of Lamentations. You see that Jeremiah was able to maintain a, a tender heart. He was busy always trying to call the people of God back to a right relationship with God. Think about that. His ministry was not to go to a lost and dying world, quote unquote, to nations that did not know Yahweh. He was sent to the people of Israel, (laughs) the people of God, the people that should know the Lord And these people, God's own people, did not have an ear to hear anything that Yahweh, the Creator, would say unto them. He sought to bring the wayward people back into a right relationship with God, but all he found was people who refused to respond, who refused to listen, who refused to turn. No one was going forward in their relationship with God, but they continue to pursue uh, or follow away from God and in their constant rebellion against Him. The people's heart had hardened through the years because of sin and rebellion. That's the great danger. The the danger of our hour is that we are in that same uh, mindset, the same days, if you would stop and think about that. The same atmosphere abounds in our society. Isn't that true? Uh, We have, even in America, people that once were favored of God, that knew the Lord, but look at what's going on in America, and especially in the American church, and see an unwillingness to really get serious with God and listen to God and obey His voice and obey Him on the simple elementary things of Christianity, right? Not the greater calls, the greater calls, but just the basic elementary things of Christianity. Many have no ear, no ear to hear what God's will is for them, despite their willful disobedience uh, to God's word. Jeremiah remained a faithful and steadfast testimony in his day against the people and their unwillingness to do God's will. When you think about that generation, and here is this lone man willing to be obedient to Yahweh in all things, and what a testimony against his generation that they did not want to obey God at all And here's a man who's willing to obey God in everything. I want to draw your attention tonight to, first of all, the pleading of the prophet, the pleading of the prophet. Many of these things we've considered before as we've moved through the book of Jeremiah, but just to focus in on them again, look at Jeremiah and his effort, his effort. Verse 2 says that which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah, and notice, and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Uh, I I believe what that passage is trying to indicate to us is that Jeremiah was a busy man trying to spread God's words of warning. I, I think Jeremiah gave it everything he had. If there's a word for us in that, I think that we 
should be challenged to maybe even exert more energy as we try to warn our generation. The tendency is, if they're not hearing, go silent. Isn't that true? I face that. I don't know if you battle that. But when people don't respond, my old flesh says, hey, nobody's listening anyway, just be quiet, right? But that was not the attitude or heart of Jeremiah at all. Uh, his effort was intense. He wanted everyone to hear. And I believe it's not just saying that he gave this message to all of Jerusalem and all of Judea. I believe it's also implying that he did his best to get that message out to every little community that he possibly could get that message to to try to turn the heart of the people of his day back to Yahweh, their true and living God. Jeremiah says in verse number 3 that he spent 23 years doing that. Amen? At this time in chapter 25, he's recording that time in chapter 25 that he had spent 23 years in the effort of trying to get the message of God's Word out. That's not a long period of time, uh, but that's long enough to say this man was really earnest about his effort in getting the Word of God out to God's people. And notice it wasn't just that he spent this uh, 23 years. Notice what it says in verse 3 also toward the end. And I have spoken unto you rising early and speaking. I think that's another indication of his effort. He was not a slothful man. He got up early in the morning and said, I've got to go back out and warn. Can you imagine that? Every day, getting up and then laboring all day only to go home at night. And maybe the wife would say, hey, uh, was there any response today? And the prophet would have to say, sweetheart, there was no response today. And he gets up early the next morning, goes out, spends the entire day warning, crying, weeping, turn, and he comes home again evening after evening after evening having to give the same report over and over again. No one wants to hear. No one wants to listen. No one's repenting. No one's responding. I'm telling you, it speaks uh, volumes to our day. But see, we shouldn't be surprised that people are responding today like they responded back in Jeremiah's day. I think that's the mistake that we make. We don't see a revival or we don't see a turning and, and we're quick to kind of give up or throw in the towel and we need to be reminded of people like Jeremiah and Noah and Jesus and Isaiah and others who said, listen, I'm not in this just for numbers or for a claim. This is the calling God has placed in my life and I will be faithful to my post. I will do God's will regardless of what the world does in response to God's warnings, His offers of salvation and eternal life. It wasn't just Jeremiah that spent his effort in trying to get this message of warning out Jeremiah reminds us that other prophets had already spent a large portion of their life agonizing, laboring, warning. Verse number 4. And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. Jeremiah said, I'm carrying on a long list of God-called men doing what God has sent men to do year after year, month after month, generation after generation. If you look at it, I mean in the long term, it's an amazing thing to be a part of a faithful remnant. Amen? And it's also an amazing part, uh, to be a part of carrying the gospel on to the next generation. Amen? We have to stop and think about it sometimes. We warn the sinner, you're not going to live forever, sinner. You need to come to Christ 
and be saved before it's eternally too late. Well, pastors and prophets don't live forever. <laughs> Someone else is going to have to stand behind this pulpit. Maybe sooner than later, right? And that message still needs to go out. It still needs to be proclaimed. And we still need young men that will pick up that banner and carry it a little bit further to the next generation and be faithful in their generation like Jeremiah was faithful in his generation. Amen? I imagine Jeremiah thought many times, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And he may not know it, but we could say to him tonight, Jeremiah, thank you for your example. Amen? Isn't that true? We, we can read the Scriptures and come back and say, Hey, Jeremiah, thank you for your example. We're living in days just like these days. Oh, it would be easy to preach in Jonah's time when Nineveh has all come, the entire city, and knelt before Yahweh and said, We want to get forgiveness for our sins. Wow, an amazing revival. But that's not always been the response to the preaching of God's Word, has it? Amazingly, sometimes the preaching, the response to the preaching of God's Word is nothing at all. <laughs> no, no movement, no tears, no response, just a continually heading off into hell with no regard for their soul or for their eternal life. The effort of Jeremiah is a great effort, a wonderful testimony how that we need to be faithful to God. No matter how long God stretched out His arm, the people in Jeremiah's day continually pushed it aside. But notice the ear of the people. You know, sometimes when God says something one time, it's sufficient, really sufficient to say, wow, that's a terrible Age. That's a terrible response. That's an awful way to treat God. When He speaks not to give an ear to Him, what a great sin. Amen? But I don't know if you caught it when we were reading in Jeremiah 25, but some four times Jeremiah repeats, some four times he repeats, they did not hear. They would not listen. They would refuse to hear. They would not respond. Hear it again in verse number 3, the latter portion of that. In verse Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 3, but ye have not hearkened. Verse number 4, but ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. You didn't even twist your head the slightest to say, hey, what, what was it that God had just said? You just kept walking like you didn't hear a thing. Not only that, but notice in verse number 7 and the beginning of that verse, yet ye have not hearkened unto me. In verse number 8, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words. I mean, I think that God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is just trying to lay it out like a, a lawyer and drive home the truth, the great offense, the great sin, the awful act of rebellion was they refused to hear anything God had to say. God had warned them time and time and time and time and time again. And I could go on and spend, just say over and over, time, 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 time and time, right? <laughs> Until we had spent about three hours here. And it still wouldn't explain how much that God had spoken and witnessed and warned the people. If you would stop doing what you're doing, you would not suffer any harm. You would not be hurt. You wouldn't have to be destroyed. But no one quit making their idols. They just kept right at home making idols like God had never said a word. And they kept bowing before them. And they kept offering sacrifices up uh, in, uh, to them in their name. And they uh, kept serving them. And they kept 
living for them in great rebellion against God. You say, what does that have to do with us? Well, be careful. I don't know of any of you that are doing this, but it's a dangerous thing for God to keep speaking to you and you ignore what He's saying. That's very dangerous. If you're a Christian, that means that God may either chasten you or God may do something other than just uh, physical chastisement. He could just take you out of the world, just get I mean, just end your life, right? Right, he does have the right to say, I brought you in this world, and I can take you out. <laughs> Moms may not have that. I mean, they have an argument. But God's only, really the only one that can say, I brought you in this world, and I can take you out. And not listening to him is extremely offensive. Listen to him. God speaking in Proverbs chapter number 1. In verse number 22. How long? you simple ones, that is, you naive fools. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Isn't it amazing how Satan loves to turn things around? (laughs) The atheists call, they call us fools, right? And God says, you're the naive ones, you're the fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And God said, they are foolish. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. If you you will listen to me, just do what I'm telling you to do. I will. I will bless you. I will help you. No harm will come if you'll just listen to my words. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not all of my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. You see, people all over the world say, I don't need God, I don't need God, but you've heard time and time again there's no atheist in foxholes, right? I mean, if you're on an elevator and it starts sliding down fast, most people say, oh God, <laughs> right? Have you ever watched these uh, shows where they, they get a new car or they get a new home or home is... Uh, redone and it's the first time they ever seen it what's, most of the time what's the first thing they say and most all of them say it oh god oh wow that's right <laughs> it's the first thing on their lips you can refuse to obey him all you like you can say god I'm not going to listen to a word you say but I want to warn you again there's going to come a time that you're going to be in that state of calamity you're going to be over the deathbed of a loved one or you're going to be in a serious incident and you needed God more than you ever needed Him before and if your habit has been just turning away your ear guess what He is promising you you turn your ear away from me the hour of calamity when your fear comes I will turn my ear away from you Could you imagine when the Babylonians did break through the gates and started uh, running through the streets of Jerusalem and you picture what Jeremiah describes in the book of Lamentations. I wonder how many of those people got on their face and began to say, Oh, oh Yahweh, oh Yahweh, save us, spare us. Have mercy on us. Save my children. God, keep us from this judgment and this wrath. It was too late then. There does come a time that the God is not going to just keep warning and warning and warning and warning and warning, right? You know that? Well, like parents do sometimes, right? Uh, it was one of my girls that they said they try to stay away from when they're dealing with the kids, they try to stay away from saying, all right, now when I count to three, <laughs> because 
What do most kids do? Do they respond on one? No. I'm going to count to three now. <laughs> do they respond on two? No. They're not worried about one or two. Right? All right, now two and a half. <laughs> You say, where does that come from? I think that kind of comes from God's heart it's himself. That's how he really is. He's like, I don't want to pour out wrath. I, I don't want judgment. I don't want destruction. I want to spare you. I want to save you. I want to rescue you. And, and listen, I don't think you can argue with that when you look at the Bible and see what God does. Amen? Jeremiah's been preaching for 23 years. That's after years and years and years of other prophets saying the same thing. And God's still holding back, really, a wrath that is right that rightly should be poured out. But after a while, three comes. Right? No matter how many, two and a half, two and three quarters, right? I mean, after a while, three, it does come. And when three comes, it's too late then. Often the child, when they realize three is about the next one that's going to be announced, they will straighten up their behavior. Sadly, many people don't ever do that when they're in their relationship with God. He can warn them, listen, I'm almost at the point now, I've just stopped dealing with you. And it would be almost like God had not said anything about that. That would scare me to death. Wouldn't it scare you to death if God said, all right, I'm done with that. I'm done with you now. I've told you and told you and told you. And all you've done is play games with me. And so I'm through with it. I would hate to hear those words. But he said, when your calamity comes, guess what I'll do? I will mock when your fear cometh. Verse 27, when your fear cometh and desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. And some people hearing this would say, God, that is not right. You should hear. I mean, look, they're in great distress. <laughs> right? Wait a minute. How many times did God speak and they just disregarded it all together? They should have listened. Amen? Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer them. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For, they, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of, of evil. Amen? And listen, to you who are here and trying to be faithful to God, those are the things you need to remember. Let the, let the world be as crazy as they want to be. Let quote-unquote Christians just ignore God altogether after all the warnings that we give them, right? But I want to be quiet from the fear of evil. I want to be in the favor of God. I want to be found faithful to Him and to His Word. The ear of the people that turned away from the Lord. When that great deacon Stephen was preaching and he gave a history of Israel and how they responded to God. Moments later, this godly deacon would be stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. Just like they treated all the prophets before him, right? It wasn't, not an, it wasn't a new day in Stephen's day. Israel was treating God's prophets and preachers just like they had always treated God's prophets and preachers, right? He said this about the nation of Israel in verse 51 of Acts 7. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So it's one thing to read about the people in Jeremiah's day and 
and the people that lived in Jerusalem and the people of Judah and how that God was trying to keep them from destruction and the Babylonian destruction. And if they would have just heard and listened and repented, God would have stayed His wrath. But they would not. But what about our day? I honestly think that God is speaking the, uh, along the same lines in our day, right? I think He's trying to get the attention of our nation. And He's doing that through tornadoes and, and uh, what people just say, weather events, and He is working at trying to arouse us and break our hearts and get our minds on Him again. And He's calling out, but very few people have an ear to hear what God is saying. And in, in churches, He's speaking and speaking, and yet the altars are empty. It is like Noah's day, right? Men are not coming. Men are not surrendering. Notice the evangel's promise in verses 6 and 7. He said, listen, because you refuse to hear, the, the warning was don't serve other gods, don't worship them, don't make any more images, and if you will do that, no harm. Isn't that beautiful? Just stop that. Quit with the idolatry. Don't make any more idols. Turn away from those false gods. And no hurt. No harm. But the people in Jeremiah's day refused to hear. Verse 6, And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with your, the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt or no harm. Now just think about that again with me. He has offered this olive branch, hasn't he? If you've been listening closely through the book of Jeremiah, he's been reaching out over and over again, offer, offering the olive branch, trying to bring them back to himself and saying, listen, just give up this idolatry and you're not going to suffer any hurt, no harm. Just come to me. Get right with me. And yet they would not Listen, yet, he says in verse 7, yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord. You still have not responded to me that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. That's the pleading of the prophet. Listen to the punishment of the people. Verse number 8, therefore, right? Bible teachers and preachers say when you read a wherefore or therefore, find out what it's there for. And go back and say, hey, what is he saying it's there for about? Because you refuse to obey. Now listen, if God would do that for a nation, would he do it for a, for a person, a church, right? Isn't that true? It's not just that God deals with nations that won't hear he, deal, he also deals with individuals that don't want to hear and his announcements are the same. To the individual, listen, obey, respond. No harm if you'll do that. But if you refuse to listen, therefore. And God announces punishment against these rebellious people. God is a long-suffering, patient, tender-hearted, merciful, compassionate God. Isn't that good to know that He is that kind of God? I mean, I, I mean His long-suffering amazes us, doesn't it? But He is also a holy, just, righteous, and vengeful God. Don't forget that he is also a God of vengeance. Right? He, he, he is a God that will pour out fury. His anger does wax hot. Right? You won't hear that on TBN. <laughs> but that's still the true character of God. He is a God whose anger is furious. And his wrath is overwhelming. Do you 
really want to resist Him? Think about that. Do you really want to fight against? Why would you do that? Why fight against a loving, tender, compassionate God? Amen? Why? He only wants your best. Do you really want this side of Him? Do you really want Him to pour out His anger and His wrath? I never will forget uh, Brother Johnny Pike's testimony. I shared this with you once in a while just to remind you that God does have a point and He gets to and then the therefore comes. And every time Brother Johnny shares this with us, it's a heartbreaking true story though. He had three boys and then they had to finally had a little baby girl. And the baby girl had a little heart problem. And the doctor said, hey, she's five years old, it's not going to be any big deal. I've done this surgery so many times before. There's really nothing to it. And they go in there and they say, we'll be out in a certain amount of time. And they in there and they pass that in amount of time. And, and then they pass it further and further. And Brother John and them start getting worried. And finally the doctor comes out and tearfully says, I don't know what happened. We lost her on the operating table. We lost your little girl on the operating table. And Brother John didn't say a word. He, he, he did say that. He said, I know what happened. And he immediately turned and went to the chapel and got in the altar and said, God, I will preach your word. I will preach your word. Sadly, it doesn't have to come to that. Does it? Why do we push God so far and then when He does something, oh, why would you ever do that? Because you pushed me to a point of no return. It was either get your attention and see many perish or just let you, you, know, let you go, see many saved or just let you go and see many perish. One or the other. And I'll tell you honestly, I thank God a million times over, not that he lost his daughter, but a million times over that Brother John has been called into the ministry. He don't, I don't know how many times he's helped me Amen? Be careful. Noah warned and warned and warned but there come a day when God shut the door of the ark. You read that story. Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door of the ark and the flood came. And we're in those same type of days, right? That we know Christ is coming back. We know this earth shall melt with a fervent heat. We know there's going to be seven years of horrendous tribulation. If you think some of the little scuffles out and the protesters is is that's irritating. That's only just that's just irritating. Could you imagine if the streets, every city looked like that? In every street. And it was just no law at all. Can you imagine what kind of day that would be? When you can only buy food for your wife or your husband or your children if you yield it to the mark of the beast. I was sharing with Brenda and the carry on the ride over here tonight. Europe has gone to a, I just saw the uh, uh, title, Europe has gone to a cashless society. I have to look and do some more reading up on that, but it said Europe has gone to a cashless society. Say, we're so close to the mark of the beast, and yet, yet what are people doing? They're acting like God has never said anything. He's never stopped and warned us. You know what it says in the New Testament? Pray that you may be counted worthy to escape such tribulation. Look at your life and your heart. Do you think you know that you would be worth, that you're living a, a halfway decent, committed life that? Christ would say, yes, you're serving me, come on up. Or would you think that he might say, I'm going to let you just suffer down here with the, uh, the unsaved. You, you have no interest in me whatsoever. Why should I take you up to my heaven? I don't mean that you lost your salvation, but why not stay down in the world? You weren't interested in this kingdom. You had no concern about my heaven, my kingdom. Why not just leave you down here for seven years of tribulation since you had no interest in spiritual things at all? I hope that's not the case. I hope he calls all of us up, right? 
But there are some warnings that sound like some of us may suffer like sinners suffer. And I know that's not hell. Amen? Could that be the great tribulation? That's something to think about, right? So our day, these same warnings apply to our day. God will pour out His wrath. By the way, if you were to go and lift up the lid to hell, you would hear hundreds of millions of people crying out because they died in their sin rejecting Christ. Every sinner that dies rejecting Christ will go to hell. The therefore of refusing the message of the gospel, the therefore of that is eternal punishment ultimately in the lake of fire. If you don't think God is going to keep that promise, then there's no promise of heaven. Amen? If we're going to go to heaven when we die, people who are lost are going to go to hell when they die. Because God has said both things. Amen? The punishment of the people. But notice also the promise of the prophet. It's interesting when Jeremiah gives this 70-year word that's meant to be an encouraging word, I find it interesting that really it's a word of condemnation against who? The instrument of God's wrath, the Babylonians. Did you find that interesting? When Daniel reads it, he's going to be excited and overwhelmed. We're almost at the time when we can start going back. Seventy years is up. But you know what that meant? That meant the reign of the Babylonians was up also. Remember the Babylonians in their day were lifted up with pride. They forgot about the lesson God taught Nebuchadnezzar as he wandered in the wilderness like a wild animal for 70 years and finally came back to himself and he said, Daniel, your God is the only God. Yahweh is the God. There's no other beside him. But Belteshazzar forgot that lesson. Either his father or grandfather taught him. Amen? And with great pride in his heart, he went to the uh, utensils that were captured in, in Jeremiah's day from the temple, and he brought them into a place where they were having just a party lifestyle and poured wine into those holy vessels and started drinking out of those holy vessels and blasphemy and then the handwriting on the wall. Amen? Because of pride, God was going to turn His wrath towards His instrument of judgment. Sometimes we look at the nations of the world, you may wonder, why does God use this nation or why does God use this nation? And I think for the most part, America can say, I think honestly, without any um, rewriting of history, that when we have been involved in conflicts, we were really involved in those conflicts for a righteous cause. It wasn't, and, and by the way, notice what we do when we go to an area. Uh, we don't claim it. We don't set up our flag. We don't take over, do we? We usually go in there and try to deal with what's wrong, and then we just give it back to the people. <laughs> when Japan made a full surrender, right? We had all the right in the world to go in there and say, okay, now it's ours. And we're going to set up our place over here in Asia. We didn't do that at all. We said, I'll tell you what, y'all just do right, <laughs> and we'll give it back to you. I mean, you don't see that in many other nations in the world, do you? And yet, God is going to use. Uh, uh, Babylon and he, uh, as he used them he is also going to destroy them because they never learned the lesson of who the true and living God is or was at their time right my, my point is this that just because we've been the instrument in God's hand doesn't mean that God won't pour out his wrath on us let me end with this 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17 listen to this verse for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who, who do not obey the gospel of God? Listen, if God would treat Israel this way, 
What about these nations around her that encouraged her to commit these kind of sins? Look at Jeremiah 25, verse 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name and should be utterly and sh- and you should be utterly unpunished. He said, I'm going to punish the city that's called by my name and should you be utterly unpunished? Ye shall not be unpunished for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. He said, all, all these nations around, God said, I am going to pour out my wrath on, on the, uh, my own people. And he gives a list of all these, uh, Edom and Amnon and Moab and uh, Tyrus, all these nations surrounding Judah and Jerusalem. And he says, listen, if I will, treat, if I will do my people this way, you don't stand a chance. See, God not only judges the sinner, right? But He does judge the saint. One day He's going to cast all the lost into uh, the lake of fire after they stand before Him in the great white throne of judgment. This, but this, just hear me now. You know, every one of us will also stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See, we're going to be judged. What did we do with Jesus? How precious was Jesus to us? How important was He to you? Were you? Did you encourage the church? Did you labor for Christ? Did you love me? And I hope all of us can say, yes, Lord, we were faithful. We served you. We loved you. And He'll he'd be able to say, yeah, that's the record. That's the true record. I've got it all recorded. That's true about you. Amen? Versus, I don't want to stand there having accepted Christ and then saying, hey, I'll just live my own way. God forbid. Amen? Let's serve the Lord. He is a righteous, holy, just God. He's only going to plead with us for so long. Maybe what we ought to do tonight is to hear that pleading and respond to Him in obedience. Amen? And let Christ have His way in our lives. Let's do that, all right? Let's stand for prayer. There's rebellion and there is uh, uh, unbelief and sin. And we-